All right, guys. Good day, and hope you guys are doing really, really well. A uh, new day and new session. One of the most important sessions that you have heard for DT and for IDT. So, if you're at CA Inter and if you're giving the May twenty one attempt, in fact, even if you're at CA Final and giving the May twenty one attempt, this next video lecture, which is going to come up, uh, is going to summarize all the amendments that have happened in the Finance Act twenty twenty. So, Finance Act twenty twenty, all the amendments around DT and IDT, which are applicable to CA Inter students from May twenty one. This is going to be a very, very interesting, very important video lecture. So, what about amendments and how important are amendments? The ICI sometimes can focus a lot more on amendments than anything else in the book. So, when you are looking at your regular chapters, please ensure amendments have to be done. And the best way to do amendments is all at one go. The best way to do it is not one by one. Once you finish your entire chapters, then look at amendments so you know exactly which section they are talking about. How are we going to cover amendments here? Every section which is being amended, we're going to talk a little about the section so you get a background on what the section section talks talks about, and then we move ahead and then we try and dissect what the amendment is all about. So let's start. And between DT and IDT, we're starting off with IDT amendments because they're fewer in number. I'm going to start off with them and then move to DT amendments, guys. I hope you guys are doing well. A paper, a pen, a calculator, or any book that you're referring to is all that you will need when we start off this lecture in just about any moment. All right. So, and also I have a note, uh, and this note is going to be forwarded to you uh, in a PDF format. So I'm just going to put the note up on the screen right away. I'm putting the note up on the screen so you have an idea on what we're looking at. Increasing the size of my screen so you have a good view of me as well as the note. All right, guys. Let's begin. IDT amendments for May 21. Of course, also for November 21, but in, more importantly for May 21 right now. The first amendment, guys. Is on expiry of ITC in case of debit notes, and for this, I'm just going to take you to a blank screen and just give you a little background on what is expiry. So, guys, let's say this is Vijay Sales. This is a company which sells electronic goods, and this is you. And you are also registered. You're buying something to sell it ahead. So, let's say you buy you bought air conditioners from them, so that you could sell it ahead. And you're someone who's in the same line of business. So the air conditioners, let's say, were sold for ten thousand plus eighteen hundred GST. Eleven thousand eight hundred is what you will pay to this guy, Vijay Sales. And guys, what are you expecting? You are expecting an ITC of eighteen hundred rupees. You you have paid eighteen hundred rupees tax, that is GST, and hence you're expecting an ITC of eighteen hundred rupees. That's your expectation. And what about this ITC? You will have a credit ledger. Everyone, I hope you know a little about credit ledger. The credit ledger is something. Uh, there are three books: uh, cash ledger, credit ledger, and electronic liability ledger. All three are electronic, and they open up the moment you get registered. So because you are registered, you have a credit ledger, and this eighteen hundred should ideally should ideally move to your credit ledger. This eighteen hundred rupees should should ideally, in the best way. it should go to your credit ledger because only if it goes to your credit ledger can you take can you take credit of it now you know section 161 and section 162 163 and section 164 have some conditions around this so let's talk about the first condition 161 says you need to to take this itc you need to be registered that i am plus you need to be using it for the business for the purpose of your business uh so yes I am registered, and I'm using for the purpose of my business. That means I'm going to sell this AC ahead, and hence these conditions of 16.1 are satisfied. Let's say section 16 two conditions. There are four conditions here with a short form D R G R. D, you should have a document for this. So when you purchase this AC, do you have a document? Do you have an invoice? Second, you should have received the goods. as you should have received the goods and if you are receiving them in lots you should have received the last lot as well next the government should have got the money that's for g and last r the returns the returns should have been filed so these are four conditions and only when these four conditions are met can you take this itc can you take this it itc to the credit ledger now let's say you bought this this transaction happened guys today that is the 27th of february This is when the transaction happened, twenty seventh February twenty one. So this is the financial year twenty twenty one. I'm just going to put this in a timeline format, so you all have an idea. This is your financial year. 
starts on 1st of April 20 and goes on till 31st March 21. And somewhere here on the 27th of Feb, you bought this item. So on the 27th of Feb, this transaction happened. Now, for some reason, for some reason, let's say you did not get an invoice. So you don't have a document and because you didn't have an invoice, this 1800 credit cannot right now be taken to that ledger because one of the conditions of 16.2 is not met and hence you can't take this to the credit ledger right now. So you will wait. You will call up Vijay Sales. Listen, I need the invoice. He'll say, I've sent it to you, but it's lost somewhere in the middle. So you don't have an invoice for that till the year end. No problem. Even if you don't have till the year end, no problem. You get some more time. I'm just going to remove this so we have more space to write. Even then, it's not a problem because after the year ends, after the year ends, you have some more time till that time this ITC will not expire. So we're talking about expiry of ITC and section 16 subsection 4 talks about when this ITC will expire. So this ITC will expire on 20th October. That is one of the dates. 20th October. Why 20th October? They don't say 20th October. They say the September return filing due date. And as you know, in GST, you file returns monthly also. So September month ka return you will file on 20th October. So either that date. So this is the due date for which month? For the month of September or, or the actual date, not the due date, the actual date when you file your annual return. And of course, expiry, things expire early. So as earlier of the two guys, between the two, whichever is earlier will be the last date by when the ITC should be taken the credit ledger, otherwise it will expire. So on the 20th of October, and let's say you filed your return, return filing due date is actually 31st December, but that's the due date. When did you file it? Let's say, let's say that's the due date. So I'm putting it up. Let's say you filed the return on the 21st November. So either 21st November, that's the day you file your annual return or 20th October, whichever is early. So first figure out whichever is early. 20th October is the earlier one. So 20th October guys should be the date by when this year's ITC should be taken to the credit ledger. And if you don't take it, unfortunately, it will expire. So if you are looking out for the document, please find it soon because by this date, if you don't find it, because now we figured which is the earlier date by this date, you should take it to the credit ledger. Otherwise, like your medicines, this X, this ITC is going to expire. What about after it goes to the credit ledger guys, once it goes to the credit ledger, you can use the credit whenever. This month, next month, next to next month, there is no problem with that. But you should ensure, guys, you should ensure that this is taken by these expiry dates. This is taken to the ITC. This ITC is taken to the credit ledger. Now, this is the background. Now, let's go to the main point. Now, let's go to the main point. Let's say he, while billing, while billing, Vijay Sales had to bill you 10, he had to bill you actually 12,000 rupees. He actually had to bill you 12,000 rupees, but unfortunately he billed you only 10,000. There was some mistake because of which either the quantity or the value or the tax rate was lower. He realized that the value was lower. So he had to now increase the value. And how can he do that? One of the ways he can do that is issue a debit note to you. So guys, Vijay sales is issuing a debit note to you. I'm just putting the details of the debit note. Debit note, by the way, guys, will increase the amount because either the quantity will increase, either the value will increase or the tax. I call it QTV. Either quantity or tax or the value will increase. Here, the value is increasing 2000. On that, guys, 18% GST is 360 rupees. So he will issue a debit note to you of 2360 rupees. And this debit note, guys, this debit note, please remember, is linked to this invoice. It is linked to an invoice. Now let's say he issues this debit note to you. He issues this debit note to you in the next year. Let's say on the 25th of May, 21, 2021, 25th May, he issues his debit note. He says, listen, in the invoice, I wrote the amount right, wrong. Here is the debit note. You, you take it. You say, yeah, yeah, I agree. It should be 12,000 and the 2000 debit note GST of 360 rupees. Of course, you'll want a credit of the GST. Now, what will be the expiry of this GST on the debit note? Earlier, earlier, till the amendment came in, guys. The debit note's expiry 
was the same as the expiry of the invoice. So in, invoice and debit note had the same expiry. So even if the debit note was issued in the next year, the expiry was the same, that is either 20th October or the actual return filing date. And that gave you very little time. That gave you very little time to actually take this to the credit ledger. So they amended it. And now we're talking about the amendment. Guys, in case of amendments, if there is a debit note, which has been issued, which has been issued, then the expiry of the GST will now be independently done. So check which financial year have they issued a debit note. Guys, debit note has been issued on 25th May so that is which financial year? That is financial year 2122. So you get additional time that is next year, the 20th October. So you have a lot of time to take this GST to your credit ledger. So I repeat guys, what is the amendment about? Earlier debit notes didn't have their independent expiry. Debit notes were linked to an invoice and their expiry was also linked to the invoice. But going forward for your May exams, going forward, debit notes will have an independent expiry. Of course, their expiry. So you'll have to find out which financial year the debit note was issued. And after the financial year ends, the September return filing due date, that is either 20th October or the actual return filing date, whenever you file the return, let's say return of file in August. So then whichever is earlier August, that time will be your date, last date by when this credit, this ITC can be taken to the credit ledger. And just mind you guys, once it's taken to the credit ledger, then don't worry. You can use it as and when you want. There is no stopping you from using your credit. I hope this first amendment is understood really well. Let's move on to the second amendment. All right, so let's move on to the next amendment guys. But before uh, let's start reading the first amendment expiry of ITC in case of debit notes. If any debit note has been issued in connection with any invoice, date of the debit note shall be taken into consideration for the purpose of determining the time limit and not the date of the invoice. So that means the debit note will have its own expiry independently to be invoiced. So there's an example also here. Invoice is issued on the 10th of January, 2021. And the debit note is issued in the next year because that's 20th April. So the debit note, don't worry debit note, you have an extended expiry till the year 2022, either the 20th of October or the actual return filing date, whichever is earlier. I hope this one is absolutely clear guys. Let's move on to the next one. Guys, the next one is a very simple one. It's a really simple one. I'll just put it up on the screen, just like everything. And then we'll move ahead just one second. Perfect. Guys, the next one is on the GSTR returns. So whenever, let's say this is an electric bike company. This is a company which, what does it do? What do they do? They manufacture electric bikes and they supply. And of course they are registered. And they buy their batteries from a company called Battery Supply Company. So they are a supplier. And they supply inputs to battery to electric bike company. I hope you got it. This is a supplier. This is the receiver. The receiver is registered. Of course, the supplier is also registered. And let's say they bought batteries worth 10 lakh rupees. The battery supply company also issued batteries to Maruti, Suzuki, and to several other companies. Now, what does battery supply company have to do? Is besides other returns, it has to file a GSTR 1. GST return 1. Now, how do I remember what is one for? What is the first thing that you do in your business, guys? You start a business so that you can make outward supplies. So GSTR1 is only and only for outward supplies. So for all your outward supplies, whether they are made to electric bike company, whether they are made to Maruti, whether they are made to Hyundai, wherever you're supplying, supplying your outward supplies, you need to give uh, details in GSTR1. By the way, just let's figure what, what details you need to give in GSTR1. If someone who's buying it is registered, then you need to give invoice wise details. Why? Because guys, the person who's buying will want to take credit. So you need to give details of each invoice, not upload the invoice, but give details, invoice wise details of who has bought what, because they are ahead are going to take ITC. Next, if they are unregistered, then doesn't matter guys. If they are unregistered, that means they are not going to use the ITC. Then you can give consolidated details. But if it's interstate, that means from one state to the other, and if the invoice value is more than two and a half lakh, not two and a half lakh up to, but more than two and a half lakh, then you need to, even in case of unregistered, you need to give invoice wise. When do you need to give invoice wise in case of unregistered? When it is interstate and the value of the invoice is two and a half lakhs plus, not exact two and a half lakhs, more than two and a half lakhs. Now let's go to the amendment. 
now this gst or one monthly was becoming a pain for a lot of small people so they said they said if you're a small assessee and they define small assessee by turnover and they said that if your turnover if your turnover in the preceding year is up to 1.5 crores if your turnover in the preceding year is up to 1 and 1/2 crores that means you're not a very big player you're not a very big supplier you're a small supplier then this gstr you don't need to file monthly you can file it quarterly so for april may june for july august september for october november december and for jan jan feb march as you cannot manipulate these quarters the quarters are fixed so for april may or june by 13th july for july august september by 13 october for october november december by 13 jan and for jan feb march by 13 april so basically once the quarter ends by the 13th you should file it that is gstr1 the benefit given to small small suppliers i hope this second amendment is clear let's read it from the book and just complete this one as well guys let's read it from the book gstr1 registered persons having aggregate turnover up to 1.5 crores in the preceding financial year or the current financial year as well shall furnish gstr1 quarterly till the 13th day of the month what about the others others need to file this gstr1 by the 10th it's been extended to 11th but how do you remember guys gstr1 just add a zero either by 10th or add a one or by 11th so actually it's by till till 10th you need to file it so for the month of jan by the 10th of feb but the government has extended it practically by one more day so you can file it by the 11th of next month but that's not the amendment the amendment is for small people can be filed quarterly i hope you got the second amendment also next guys next amendment let's quickly move to the next amendment the next amendment is really really simple and it's a very good thing but i don't know how many people are using it practically i'll tell you what the amendment is all eyes on the screen guys guys i am electric bike company i am registered i manufacture electric bikes and i supply electric bikes i sell it to a lot of people and on my outward sales i will file a return called gstr1 i hope you know this is only on outward supply how do you remember it the first thing you start in a business is start supplying outward so that is outward supply gstr1 then there is a return called gstr 3b this is also a monthly return guys and this one is more so both are monthly returns actually but this 3b1 actually the the gstr is number is 3 but 3 has not been notified yet so practically what we file is gstr 3b now this gstr 3b which you file monthly sometimes and what how what is the difference between the two this focuses only on outward supply and this one focuses on all the supplies like outward supply inward supply how much credit to take how much is your liability and if you want more difference this has to be filed by the 10th of the month practically by the 11th and this has to be filed by the 20th of the month and when i say month the next month now what they have made a change let me introduce you one more thing and then i'll tell you the change okay i can tell you the change right now only that these two returns if there is nil return where there will be nil return i could during covid i had no outward supply i had no purchases no outward supply no liability also so if you have nil returns if you have nil returns then you can file the returns using an sms facility provided by the government how is it supposed to use what is the sms number doesn't matter it will not be asked in exam but they have given you an sms facility for gstr1 gstr3 b and not just that guys if you are a composition scheme dealer remember composition scheme dealer the best thing to example is like a shoe shop let's say someone has a shoe shop and they have taken a composition scheme in composition scheme whenever you sell your sho- shoes you don't charge gst so you issue a bill of supply you don't issue an invoice you issue a bill of supply and that way you don't charge any gst so who pays the gst you pay but every quarter let's say april may june in april may june how much sales you have done you've done sales of 10 lakhs okay great congratulations is pay either 1% or 5% or 1% you calculate so let's say your trader or manufacturer then 1% so is pay 1 lakh is pay 10 lakh pay 1% is guys 10000 rupees this you will pay out of your pocket every 3 months and this guys this one is called gst cmp 08 this is filed quarterly and this is not a return guys gst cmp 8 is not a return return ke liye r aata hai 
this is just a statement that listen i have made outward sales of 10 lakh rupees in this quarter my gst at the rate of 1% is 10000 and here i am paying it so this is supposed to be paid by the 18th of the month after the quarter so for april may june when you will you pay by the 18th of july you need to pay and even in this case guys if you don't have any supply you will not have any gst to be paid so you will file a nil return through sms facility i hope you got this so sms facility extend it to three people i sms facility for nil returns for gstr 3b for gstr 1 and for gst cmp 0a for all three of them it's okay not to have supplies but guys you need to compulsorily file your nil return even nil return filing is compulsory because if you don't file your nil return then penalties of 100 rupees per day you know the penalties under section 46 and 47 Forty-seven specific, specifically, there will be penalties if you don't file a return. So even if it's nil return, make sure you're filing it. All right, let's move to the next one, guys. Slowly, steadily, we've done about three, four amendments already. Let's move ahead. We I'll summarize all the IDT amendments uh, at the end again once. Quick revision, but before that, guys, this is an invoice. What they've done recently? What they've done recently? But of course, for only for people whose turnover. only for people whose turnover is very big that is more than 500 crores so if you are someone whose turnover is more than 500 crores what you need to do is you need to take this invoice generate the invoice normally so let's say i am bajaj uh, electricals or let's say i am hero honda and i sell bikes of course more than 500 crores is my turnover so you issue normal invoices no problem but what do you do with these normal invoices after that you go and you register them online so you register these invoices online on a website and this feature is called e invoicing guys e invoicing does not mean there will be no print out of the invoice no you will generate the invoice just like every day normal but you will go online and you will generate an e invoice and in that you will get an invoice registration number so from now onwards the invoice number is not material there every invoice has a 16 digit number i hope you know that but from now onwards whenever you are supposed to quote the invoice you will quote the invoice reference number which is irn now let's go to the amendment the amendment says that in case of certain notified people who are the notified people you don't need to know but the government says that in case of certain notified people they will create they can have an option of making a quick response code this code will basically help them identify the irn a quick response code having embedded invoice reference number may be produced electronically for verification by the proper officer in lieu that is means in place of any physical copy of the invoice so you don't need to give physical copy of the invoices you just need to give the it's like a qr code guys it's like a qr code a quick response code it's like a qr code which will help them identify the invoice so you don't have to carry physically and submit documents physically i hope you got that i hope you got that next one guys is absolutely important and before that before you understand the next one i need to give you a little background i need to give you a small background let's understand let's give you a little background and then let's move ahead guys you are an electric bike company you manufacture electric bikes and then you sell it ahead you have a cash ledger electronic why because you are registered so the moment you register a cash ledger opens up a credit ledger also opens up and a liability ledger also opens up i hope you are okay with all these three so let's say on the inputs you bought you bought certain inputs and of course the inputs were which were used for these taxable supplies so you can get itc on the inputs and the itc on these inputs let's say was 20000 rupees that made you happy because you can take credit of it so you took that to the credit ledger provided all the doc, all the conditions of taking it to the credit ledger are maintained so you should have a document you should have received the goods etc etc you took 20000 to the credit ledger you sold bikes worth 10 lakhs and on that let's say you had to pay 12% interest so or sorry 12% gst so 1 lakh 20000 is what the customers will pay you 
So the customers will pay you 11 lakh 20, and on that 1 lakh 20, you need to pay to the government. So your liability ledger, guys, your liability ledger has 1 lakh 20 thousand. My bad, yeah. So you need to pay to the government 1 lakh 20 thousand. Now, now, let's say this is the month of February, the current month. This is the month of February. And this is the situation. You have a credit of 20,000. 20, not for this month, but overall credit is 20,000 and your liability discharge of 1 lakh 20,000. Now, you're supposed to file your return by the 20th of March. I hope you are aware of this. Guys, every month you need to file a return and this month's return, February's return, you need to file by 20th March, which you did not file. You missed the date. So 20th March gone, 20th April gone, 20th May, in 20, on 20th May, finally, you're filing your return. So have you delayed the return? Yes. How many days? Of course, they will calculate and you will have to pay interest. Interest will be at the rate of 18% per annum into the amount, into how many number of days? Let's calculate the days, guys. So March 31 minus 20 days of March. No, you have to start from 21st because 21st is the day 21st is the day when it became due. 20th after you could have paid them. But you became late on paying on 21st. So this is guys 11 days of March. Plus whole of April. Plus 20 days of May. So you basically had 61 days of delay. So basically 61 days upon 365 days. Into the amount. Now here is where the amendment is. Now, how much will you, how much do you owe to the government, guys? How much do you owe to the government? How much do you need to pay to the government? 1 lakh 20,000? Do you need to pay 1 lakh 20 to the government? No. You already paid 20. In a way, guys, this is lying with the government only, right? In a way, this 20,000, who is, with, is it with? It's with the government only. So, in a way, it's lying with the government anyway. So, the interest will be chargeable only on 1 lakh. So, ask yourself before putting this amount, Always ask yourself, have you used the credit? If you've not used the credit, the government already has your 20,000. So you're delayed, but you're delayed only on 1 lakh. So only on that 1 lakh will there be interest. I hope this one is absolutely clear, guys. I'm taking it from the book, making you read section 50, subsection 1 on interest. Interest on delayed payment. You're supposed to be, but you got delayed. Under section 50, subsection 1. Interest at the rate of 18%. Guys, there are only two interest rates in the GST Act. One is 18% where, of course, uh, there are three interest rates, but when they, when you have to pay them, there are two interest rates. One is 18% when you pay them on delayed payments. And one is also 24%, which generally you will see at CA final level. So interest at the rate of 18% per annum shall be levied only on that portion of the tax that is paid by debiting the electronic cash ledger. Guys, that means only the net amount which you will pay through your cash ledger. How much would you pay in our example, guys? How much would you pay through your cash ledger? Your cash ledger, you have 1 lakh 20. You will use this 20 first. And what about the remaining 1 lakh? You'll have to deposit cash and use that cash to pay off your liability. So whatever you deposit your cash ledger by, that much amount, guys, that much amount interest will be levied on. That's what section 50, subsection 1 spoke about. So interest calculation, no problem. Days calculation, no problem. Only the amount should be the net amount. That's what they're talking about. This one, guys, could be a really good question in your exam this time because it's a very interesting and a very new concept. All right, the last two before we complete the, the exemptions on, on IDT, or sorry, the amendments on IDT. The next one, you know, goods transport agencies. So guys, I'm actually from Bombay, but I'm now going to move to Bangalore for a while. And let's say I want to transport some goods from Bombay to Bangalore. I will take the help of some agency which will call a goods transport agency. You know, transporting goods should not become really very expensive for common people. For businessmen, okay. If let's say they want to, let's say if they want to transport these, if Samsung wants to transport mobile phones from one city to the other, then it's okay to charge them GST. But generally, goods transport should not become very expensive for small people because for people like you and me, when we transport, let's say I'm moving to Bangalore for a while, I need to transport some goods. Or let's say fruit sellers want to sell fruit or supply, you know, transport fruits. 
or people want to transport basic stuff it should not be very expensive so there are a lot of exemptions there are a lot of exemptions which are there on goods transport agency i'll give you some basic exemptions that inland waterways goods transport is exempt even through railways if you're transferring a lot of goods they're exempt so on goods transport agency there are a lot of exemptions i'm not going through all of the exemptions because that's a very big uh, exemption but as you know goods transport has a lot of exemptions overall guys exemptions to the common men to unregistered people to private people exempted but big businessmen like businessmen like you know if uh, samsung wants to transport their phones from bombay to delhi then they will be charged gst if they are using the services of a gta but my point is not that my point is let's say let's say jio wants to launch a satellite why they have to telecommunication so a better network they want to launch a satellite can they go can you know mukesh amani go and just light up and just take a satellite up no he can't do that so he will take the help of some something called isro international space research association or organization sorry my bad or there are other companies like antrix corporation limited so if there are about two three companies like that which we will see the names isro is one of them antrix corporation is one of them so if they launch the satellite if they launch the satellite for jio and they charge jio something on that there will be no gst because guys in a way isn't aren't they also transporting goods isn't satellite also goods aren't they also transporting goods so in a way they are also transporting goods and hence in this case also there is no gst there is an exemption on this i is reading the exemption exemption satellite launch services supplied by isro antrix corporation or new space india limited shall be exempted so this is just one addition to something that we already study under goods transport agency and now guys time for the last amendment last amendment and then idt amendments are done okay moving ahead moving ahead and doing the last amendment so recently i bought something from amazon let's say i bought a coffee mug worth 1000 rupees from amazon I bought a coffee mug of one thousand rupees from Amazon. Now, guys, on the invoice there was an H S N code. Everyone on the invoice, besides other like uh, description, Amazon's name, uh, their address, the GST number, etc., there was an H S N code that is harmonized system of nomenclature. What is this? This is used to classify goods because goods can be so many. Coffee mug. A team, a teacup, a thermos, a, a jar, a pen, a charger, a mobile phone, earphones. You know, for every product, there is a different H S N code to classify them so that we identify the rate to be applied to them. So H S N codes. How do you use them? When does the seller use a H S N code? So if his turnover is up to five crores, that means not too big, guys. Not too big. Amazon has thousands of crores of turnover, but let's say you're a smaller entity and your turnover is only up to five crore, then, then you have two choices. If someone is unregistered, then you may put a then you may may put an H S N code, four digit. Why do I say may? Because it's your choice if you want to put H S N code or not. You want to put put. If you don't want to put, don't put. Doesn't matter because guys, सामने वाला guys unregistered. He is not going to take ITC, so it doesn't really matter. So if he's unregistered, you want to put four digits HSN code. Great. It takes a lot of time, guys, to search for HSN code to put the right HSN code, etc. But if he's registered, then you need to compulsorily put four digits only. But it's compulsory. So digits remain the same. Four digits here, four digits here. So if your turnover is up to five crore. And guys, five crore, four is lower. So if it's lower than five crore, then the digits are also lower than five. That's a shortcut to remember is if the digits are up to, uh, if the turnover is up to five, five se niche hai, a uh, five ya se niche to four digits. And if it's more than five crore, then compulsory HSN code of six digit. How do you remember this, guys? A shortcut here also is five se upper. So six is above five. So you need a six digit HSN code compulsorily. and hence the next time you buy something 
please make a note of it if you're buying from a big supplier like flipkart amazon or you buy from let's say a home center or you go to ikea and you buy something then when they give you an invoice it will be a six digit hsn code mentioned there whether you are registered or not does not matter they will still give you a six digit hsn so six or four digit that's the difference i is quickly summarizing these amendments so first amendment is on hsn code is four digit compulsory yes is compulsory in case of registered otherwise it's optional six digit compulsory yes if your turnover is more than 5 crore and then satellite launch services are exempted in case of making interest payment why because you've delayed in the payment of gst hota hai kabhi kabhi 18% gst you need to pay interest you need to pay but only on the net amount because you've not used the credit guys what if i'd used the credit what if i'd filed the return i'd used the credit i'd filed the return but i'd forgotten to put some liability then you will have to put the entire amount because the credit you already used tax invoice can now be a, a e invoice with a invoice reference number and you can use a quick response code instead of a physical invoice sms facility for nil returns monthly returns even for composition scheme even for outward supplies returns uh, uh, you can file a nil return only a nil return can be filed through sms and if you don't file the nil return you will also be given a late fee for that and gst are one for small people who small here guys 1.5 crore ke niche turnover hai then you can file it quarterly you have an option to do this quarterly by the 13th of the month after the quarter and expiry of itc for debit notes debit notes now have an independent expiry period they are no more linked with the invoice even if they are linked with the invoice the expiry is no more linked to the invoice that completes the amendments on itc i hope on gst i hope you understood all of them let's move ahead to the amendments on dt front all right let's dive very very well into the new session that is the dt amendment session so again guys for may 21 absolutely important because sometimes ici forgets everything else and just tries to focus on the amendments so let's in this section of the dt amendments let's focus on all the things they've changed in the finance act 2020 i'm just going to start with this sheet here i'm just going to start with this sheet here and we're going to start with 18th one and then move backwards we're going to start with the 18th one and then let's move backwards income from salary section 17 27 and 7a that's what it is let's see how that works i'm just going to enlarge the screen just one second perfect good enough really good for me works for me let's move ahead guys so let's do this amendment from the heading income from salaries now income from salaries is really wide so if they want to ask you something this could make for a really really good uh, question so this one is this let's say guys your salary is 12 lakh rupees a year that's your salary and this is your and this is you this is your employee and the employer pays you 12 lakh rupees a year this includes your basic salary of course this one guys includes your basic salary it includes your uh, dearness allowance it includes your commission it includes your bonus all those things that he wants to pay you it includes all of them so your salary is 12 lakhs but guys you know that for your benefit they they you also but employee also but employer contributes some amount to certain funds let's talk about those funds so guys there are typically three main funds one is gratuity gratuity is basically once you complete 5 years or more in an organization private organization in government organizations the rules are different but in overall if you stay for a couple of years in one organization and when you leave that organization they thank you gratuity come gratuity words come from the word gratitude gratitude they thank you by giving you a gratuity amount but how do they get this amount they don't create it overnight they contribute every year to a fund which is called a gratuity fund so let's say for this year they contributed x amount of money into the gratuity fund when they contribute that amount to the gratuity fund it remains there it grows there and at the end they can pay you the amount if you retire or you choose to leave you are paid that amount and that is called gratuity payment to you so they contribute to the gratuity fund who the employer contributes to your gratuity fund do you contribute not at all guys do you thank yourself why will you thank yourself the employer has to thank you then in gratuity fund you don't contribute to your own gratuity fund then there is a scheme called the new pension scheme nps and this is in a section called section 80 ccd 
where again your employer contributes some amount this is a new pension scheme guys and there you also uh, of course you also contribute to this fund and the the employer also contributes to this fund and this is again for your benefit so that at the end of retirement when you withdraw it or even the middle there are some rules for withdrawing it when you withdraw it it can benefit you so basically this is another fund for your benefit and then there is super annuation fund and then there is super annuation fund super annuation fund basically just like a provident fund just like a pension scheme super annuation is also another fund where you contribute but it's not compulsory for you to contribute employer can contribute he also it's not compulsory if he wants to contribute he contributes and he creates a fund so again at the end of your term at the retirement or on the death there is some amount to be paid to you so he contributes to this fund as well so guys are you benefiting yes the gratuity fund benefits you the national pension scheme that contribution benefits you and the superannuation also benefits you so great but these are not added to your salary these are not added to your salary so what happens now you are benefiting you are benefiting and the government is watching that you are benefiting and the government feels that in one year in one year if an employer contributes gratuity fund plus national pension scheme plus superannuation fund all three together of more than 7 and a half lakhs till 7 and a half lakh rupees no problem so if he is contributing is it necessary for him to contribute to all three not at all guys but if he contributes to all three even if he contributes to one two of them but the contribution is more than 7 and a half lakh rupees then that contribution will be taxable in your hands and it will be added to your salary under section 7 17 2 7 so till that amount no problem don't worry but guys this is basically for people who are high salaried high salaried people in the organization uh, if the if the organization you know puts a percentage of the salary into these funds and if it goes above 7 and a half lakhs then that excess amount not the entire amount only the excess amount goes into your salary calculation and any interest on that excess amount also on the, any interest also will be added but that's another section which is 7a interest is additional so interest is 7a so these both will be added let me just recap guys if the exam question comes that all three of them totally are, is are 7 and a half lakh rupees no problem 6 lakh rupees no problem 5 lakh rupees absolutely no problem but if it increases in one year i am not talking about over the lifetime over the lifetime gratuity becomes very big but over the period of lifetime if they do not contribute over in sorry uh, in one year they do not contribute Or all the three funds together of more than seven and a half lakh, no problem. But if they contribute, then the excess amount will be added under seventeen to seven and seventeen to seven a because this and this is a benefit to you more than the government can afford. So the government feels you are earning too much money. The employer is contributing too much for you, and hence they say that this should be added to your salary. Just reading it from from the DT amendment sheet, income from salary. in case of contribution by employer they're not talking about your contribution they're talking about employer's contribution to employee in a recognized provident fund or a scheme referred to in section 80 ccd not gratuity fund my bad sorry as the first one is a recognized provident fund so i'm just going to go ahead and change it this one is not gratuity it's provident fund that is pf where you also contribute they also contribute equally so all three of them together guys or an approved super annuation fund if all three together exceeds 7 and a half lakh 50 that means guys exact is no problem they might question you that exact 7 and a half lakh rupees that's not a problem but if it exceeds that much rupees in one year overall in four years no problem but in one year if it contributing more than this to your funds these are for your benefit then such excess amount above 7 and a half lakhs plus the interest dividend or any other amount on similar nature so not just the amount contributed but even the returns on that that also will be added into your salary under 17 to 7 and 17 to 7 a i hope this is absolutely clear this is one good amendment which has come out in salaries targeting to tax people who are earning really high salaries i hope you got this one let's move on to the next one now All right, let's go to the next amendment, guys. For next amendment, it's a very interesting amendment. Also, it has a lot of repercussions 
practically i'll tell you kya ho raha hai i'll tell you what is happening here okay so after the employer salaries this is from pgvp this is from the head pgvp let's try and see what this amendment was guys we are not talking about professions we are not talking about transport people we are talking about normal businessmen so i am talking about any normal businessman so let's say you are a businessman and you have a restaurant or you are a businessman and you have education services so you are doing any business and if your turnover if your turnover exceeds 1 crore exceeds 1 crore then you need to go and spend a little more money why because there is compulsory audit under section 44 ab how do you remember this section audit the books that's a shortcut for remembering this section 44 ab says audit the books when for a businessman when your turnover exceeds 1 crore so in this year once the financial year ends check how much is your turnover and if your turnover has exceeded 1 crore then you need to get your books audited is there a way out of not auditing it yes there is a way out under section 44 ad but we are not talking about that because the amendment is not there so yes there is a way out if your turnover is more than 1 crore up to 2 crore rupees no problem you can take the benefit of section 44 ad but we are not going to talk about that right now i have a different thing i want to talk about so this was great but this turnover guys now now with inflation and things becoming more expensive 1 crore turnover most people would most people would cross so the government said that in, instead of increasing this 1 crore limit they made a very smart move they said that we will increase this we will increase this 1 crore to 5 crores so people got very excited that how can we because the ca takes a lot of money unfortunately for this audit and it takes a lot of time etc the government said that we will make this 1 crore we will we can replace this 1 crore by 5 crore but we will do it only and only if two conditions are satisfied both the conditions have to be satisfied what is it when you are getting receipts in your business guys every business will sell something and will get money your receipts total up your receipts and then total up your cash receipts so let's say your cash receipts is let's say 3 crore rupees no let's say your cash receipts are 30 lakhs and your total turnover is let's say 4 crores then so total up all your receipts which you've got in cash divide by total turnover guys let's let's make this a round number this is 3 crores so it's 10% sorry you do not qualify then how do i qualify your receipts should be less than 5% of your turnover in cash so what are your receipts total receipts for 3 crores in the year okay now of that 5% guys is 15 lakhs so if your total cash receipts if your total cash receipts are less than or equal to 5% then we we will say that you fulfilled the first condition guys this is basically to encourage people to do less cash transactions and not just this even your payments guys the second leg of every business is payments first you get money and then you pay money the second leg also says the same thing the total of all your payments whatever is all your payments total them up total payments and see how much are cash payments how much are you making in cash guys that again should not exceed 5% that means both receipts and payments cash is okay they understand that you need to do cash payments but it should be up to 5% it cannot be more than 5% and if only if both the conditions are satisfied you will get a super enhanced limit of 5 crore so till 5 crore you don't need to call your ca to get it audited so you can then file your return without being audited so i hope you understood this one it's a very simple thing 44 ab said that audit your books of accounts if your turnover increase more than 1 crore but of course if your turnover is between 1 and 2 crore then you have a way out don't worry about it under 44 ad but we're not talking about it because our focus is on 44 ab and in 44 ab they enhance the limit to 5 crores but two conditions guys this and is so important because both the conditions need to be simultaneously followed in that year take your total receipts and see what your cash receipts is it should be not more than 5% 5% tak is okay 5% se kam is okay and same way see your total payments and your cash payments should not exceed 5% if both the conditions are fulfilled only and only then will you be subject uh, to this enhanced limit of 5 crore rupees i hope you understood this let's see it from the book and let's do this one as well business and profession compulsory audit section 44ab shortcut is audit of books 
audit of accounts of certain persons carrying on business or profession every person carrying on business shall if his total sales turnover or gross receipts as the case may be in business exceeds 1 crore in any previous year should get his accounts or the previous year audited perfect so 1 crore is the limit here however in case the cash receipts as a proportion of total receipts that is one as well as the cash payments as a proportion of total payments does not exceed 5% individually then the limit shall stand increase to 5 crores guys it's a huge jump and honestly for people who now accept online payments online payments are okay take it in your bank account okay take it through paytm okay cash avoid karna hai guys cash avoid karna hai and that is how you will fulfill this requirement of an enhanced limit of 5 crore that's a very big limit you'll save a lot of money in charges of ca while he's doing audit all right with that we complete two now let's go to the next one guys let's go to the next one the next one is a very very simple amendment very simple let me just tell you about the amendment here guys the amendment is pretty simple i'll just give you a little recap of capital gain chapter a little bit you should know before we actually do this so let's say i bought a house and this house was bought in the year 2015 and this is the year i bought it and i sold it in the year 2021 so of course this is cost of acquisition and this is sale consideration you will compare the two and then you will find out what is the gain so let's say i sold it for 1 crore i had bought it for 20 lakhs you will say that 20 lakh is the cost 1 crore is the sale of course you will get indexation benefit etc etc but that is a normal way you calculate capital gains but what if this house was not bought in 2015 but bought in the year 1995 that means guys really old house that time we didn't even know where the papers are but we know that this house is ours and now we want to sell sell it so sale consideration no problem no problem with the sale consideration but what about the cost of purchase so guys cost of acquisition there are two options one if you know your cost of acquisition you can take that no problem or you can take the fair market value as on 14 2001 so let's say you actually have the papers and this house was bought for let's say just a small amount of 1 lakh rupees so you can take 1 lakh or check the fair market value the fair market value as on 14 2001 was let's say 6 lakh 50 which one will you take of course you will take higher cost because higher the cost higher your uh, expense Uh, sorry higher your cost higher deduction and lower will be your income and tax and hence you will obviously take this 6 and a half lakhs so guys whenever you bought an asset before 14 2001 then in that case your cost of acquisition can be replaced with the fair market value if you want it if your cost is higher why will you take that so you have an option option is yours you will obviously take something which is high but guys the amendment is very very simple they say this fair market value you know valuation officers can give any fair market value of 2001 so they say this cannot exceed the fmv cannot exceed the stamp duty value so let's say if the stamp duty value on that date of this flat was 6 lakh then you cannot take 6 and a half lakhs you will have to limit it to 6 lakhs and that's the amendment guys very simple amendment let's look at the amendment from the book section 55 subsection 2 cost of acquisition if the asset is acquired before 14 2001 that means 20 years back the cost of acquisition shall be the cost price that means whatever you bought it at let's say 1 lakh or the fmv as on 14 2001 so option is yours of course you will take whichever is higher however it is now amended in case of land and building that such fair market value cannot exceed the stamp duty value guys whenever we talk about stamp duty value of course we are only talking about land and building only they have stamp duty value as on 14 2001 So I hope you got this. So that means they allow you to take a higher value, but they don't allow you to take a value which is very high. So above stamp duty value, no ways you can't do that. You can't take that. With that, we complete this amendment as well. All right, let's quickly do the next one, guys. The next one for that, I need to give you a little background. I just need to give you a little background. This is guys in a chapter called IFOS. So we've gone from PGBP to uh, capital gains now to IFOS. Let's say someone gives you a bike as a gift. Let's say this is you. Just one second. Let's say, guys, this is you, and you've got three things as a gift. One is you've got a bike as a gift, motorbike. So let's say on your birthday, some friend gives you, or your parents give you a motorbike, 
this is it taxed in your hands no because this does not come under the definition of property property ke definition mein kya kya aata hai first money comes then immobile property comes there's in shares and securities come then bullion come so misb these come and sad job that is sculptures archaeological collection drawings jewelry artwork and work of art this is some shortcut that i use to remember what are the properties against which gift taxation applies so this is the definition of property and is motorbike here is car here no is a mobile phone here so someone gives you a mobile phone a bike a car you are not subject to 56 to 10 gift tax because these are not under the definition of property the government doesn't want to tax you but let's say someone gives you gold as a gift and that is bullion or that is jewelry so you will be taxed so total up all the movable properties that you've been gifted and if the benefit to you is more than 50000 then you will be taxed under 56 to 10 so that is that is for movable property now guys let's look out for immovable property let's say someone gave you an immovable property as a gift again the benefit has to be seen at 50000 but they didn't actually gift it to you it was an immovable property whose stamp duty value was 20 lakhs guys the stamp duty value of that property was 20 lakh that means the authorities have said that this is worth 20 lakh and you got this property for just 12 lakh so have, is there any consideration is this no consideration no no there is consideration but this consideration is inadequate so in that case 56 to 10 how do you remember it i get 10 gifts every year that's how i remember this under 56 to 10 for money you know if all the money you get as gifts in the year except those occasions like marriages etc if you remove that you have to compare with 50000 even movable property you have to compare with 50000 benefit with respect to immovable property is what we are discussing because the amendment lies there with respect to immovable property what they are saying is this immovable property is actually worth 20 lakh because the stamp duty value is 20 lakh but you bought it for 12 lakh and hence you are getting a benefit you are getting a benefit and how much is this benefit of 8 lakhs so that means do you always have to buy a property at stamp duty value can you can you not get a good deal and can you not get a property at a lower value you can get a good deal no problem but the government says that if if this benefit if this benefit the government is okay with you getting a benefit but the benefit should be either 50000 or earlier it used to be 5% guys earlier it used to be 5 so if the benefit guys the benefit you are okay to get a benefit so the benefit should be either 50000 or earlier 5% of the sale consideration what is the sale consideration what are you and the buyer and seller decided 12 lakhs so 5% of 12 lakh <clears throat> 5% of 12 lakh is 60000 whichever is greater so 60000 is great so you can have a benefit up to 60000 but guys what is your benefit your benefit is a whooping 8 lakhs huge amount of benefit you got so government says this is manipulation why will someone give you a 20 lakh stamp duty value apartment for just 12 lakhs that means you paid cash to him and hence we want to tax you and this 8 lakh will be taxed in your hands in the receiver's hand always in ifos always it's from the receiver's perspective so who's the receiver you are the receiver what is the benefit 8 lakh rupees are you not supposed to get a benefit you are supposed to get a benefit earlier it was 50000 or 5% of sale consideration now they've changed it to 10% of sale consideration so now it's 50000 or 1 lakh 20 whichever is higher so they agree that there can be a difference in the price that you buy it and stamp duty value but if it's more than this difference then then they will can take the entire thing so is the benefit more than that yes it's much more than that so the entire 8 lakhs will be taxed as income under section 56 to 10 in your hands guys this is an implication under 56 to 10 this has similar implications in section 43 ca 43 ca is what guys it is pgbp but the same thing works there when you are selling a property and you are selling it for very cheap again they compare the price that you've sold it at with the stamp duty value and if the difference is more than 10% of your sale consideration again there also they will add to your income 
and the same concept is in section 56 that is capital gain so whether you are gifting it getting it as a gift or whether you are selling it under pgbp or whether you are selling it under capital gains chapter this 5% now has been replaced by 10% across so guys this could be a very good question in the exam because this makes a good question so guys please remember 5% has been changed now to 10% so you get a higher benefit 10% of what of the sale consideration of what you have decided not 10% of stamp duty value so it is 10% 10% 10% under 56 to 10 when you look at stamp duty value and the sale consideration you are allowed to get a benefit but maximum benefit is either 50000 or 10% of your sale consideration i hope you've got that well this is the end let's look at read it from the book guys let's read it from the book taxability of gift if the stamp duty value that is 20 lakhs is exceeding the actual sale consideration yes in our case it was act actually exceeding it up to 5% of actual sales consideration that means 60000 rupees then the actual say then they will believe you that yes the sale consideration is proper but now guys this 5% has been amended to 10% and this amendment is also there in section 50c and 43c so same 5% has now been amended to 10% so it will just change this number this number is 1 lakh 20 so if it's up to 1 lakh 20 no problem we will still consider your sale consideration only but if it's beyond it in our example it was beyond it then what will they take as a sale consideration they will take 20 lakhs that is a stamp duty value and from a gift tax perspective how much benefit are you getting 8 lakhs so 8 lakhs will be added in your income under 56 to 10 same same way guys 5% has been made to 10% in both the other sections that is 50c and 43c All right, let's move on to the next one now. All right, the next one is a very theoretical one. It's a very simple one. It's I will take it straight from the book, guys. It's section one thirty nine, return of income. So another chapter, which is very small in case of uh, see enter return of income. So whenever you earn income at the end of the year, so from April to March, that is the financial year, the previous year you earn money, and in the assessment year you file your returns. And when you file your returns, there are due dates. The first due date is as early as thirty first July. So the year ends on thirty first March. You have April, May, June, July, four months, and by thirty first July you should file your returns. But what if you are subject to audit? If you are subject to to audit, then guys, the CA will take more time to audit your books of accounts, and hence you get an extended due date, and you can you get an extended due date, and we're talking about that. Guys, what if I am not audited? I am a partner in a partnership firm. Let's say I am not auditable. That means my income is not so high that I am auditable, but my partnership firm is auditable. Then, if my partnership firm is auditable, that means the CA will check the financials of my partnership firm, and the CA will tell whether it's okay or not okay, and he gives a go ahead, and only then after that I can finalize my returns because the partnership firm has to pay me some salary, has to pay me some remuneration, interest, etc. And as you know, guys, in section forty, subsection B, there are limitation on how much salary, remuneration, interest they can pay me. So the CA will have to approve that, and how much ever is approved or allowed as a deduction for the partnership firm, only that much I am allowed to take in my income. So for that, guys, all in all, once only once when the partnership firm's accounts are audited or completed, then only I will be able to file my return. So hence, I will have to wait till the partnership firm's uh, audit is done. So in that case, for me also, 31st July deadline is not there. I also get an extended deadline. just like someone who's getting audited although i am not being audited my partnership firm is being audited earlier this limitation was only for working partners non working partners could file their returns on 31st july or had to file their returns by 31st july but now now they made a change that whether you are a working partner or a non working partner of a partnership firm and if the partnership firm is required to be audited then you also wait let's read that one earlier only working partner of a firm whose accounts are required to be audited shall be required to file the return of income by or before 30th september so earlier only working partners would get an extended deadline but now all the partners are required to file on or before 31st october that means guys now all of whether you are working whether you are not working if your partnership firm is being audited then you also got to wait and once it's finalized then only so you also get an extended deadline for that 31st october for all partners now and next guys earlier for companies and for any person other than company that means companies or other people you were required to get your books of accounts audited and file the return by 30th september but abhi thoda sa change ho gaya hai abhi audit report pehle and fir return bharna hai 
so earlier there was one same date 30th september for both getting it audited also and filing a return also but now they've said that although you're still supposed to get the audit done and uploaded by 30th september then you're supposed to file the return by 31st October. That means they've now made a gap. So how do you remember this? The return filing date is 31st October. And one month before that, that is 30th September, is the date you're supposed to file your tax audit report. So does something change? Yes. Some things change, some things don't. Some things don't change. Both you need to file your return also and audit report also. But now there's a gap. First audit report and then the return. A comes before R. Audit comes before return. That's how you remember this one. Section uh, 139 one, amendment number 14 in our, in our list. Let's move on to the next one, guys. Very simple one, the next one. All right, for the next one, it's a really interesting one and it has a very nice shortcut to remember the next amendment, guys. So let's start focusing on the next amendment now. Immediately on the screen, guys, is the next amendment, a first one on another chapter called TDS. Now, we're covering two amendments here. First up, guys, you are an e-commerce participant. Who are you? You are an e-com participant. What is an e-com participant? Is someone who sells on an e-commerce website. So let's say you sell water bottles on an e-commerce website called Amazon. And when you sell, of course, Amazon collects the money and then every week, every month, etc., it does a payout to you. And when they pay you money, they, they pay you money. So the government said that when they pay you money, why not collect money from their end? So they said, they introduced a new section called section 194O and there's a shortcut for this one and they said Amazon when they are making payments to you need to deduct TDS at the rate of 1%. So a very small amount of TDS of 1% the e-commerce operator has to deduct while they pay you and of course that along with the other TDS they have to pay to the government. Now guys this one this 1% let's talk a little about that. So e-commerce participant you understood, Amazon you understood. This 1% TDS will not be applicable. So there's an exception to that. And what is the exception? If the e-commerce participant is an individual or an HUF and the turnover of sales on that e-commerce platform is not more than 5 lakh rupees, then in that case, it is an exception that you don't need to deduct TDS. But more than the exception, guys, right now my focus is that this for this TDS to be only 1%, the participant has to give you the PAN. Whatever his PAN number is, they need to provide it. And in case they don't provide it, then under section 206 AA, generally when people don't provide their PAN, you need to deduct TDS at a very high rate, that is 20%. But here they've been very lenient and they said because this section is new and also because in case of online, the margins are not really high. So they said, in case you don't provide the PAN, then TDS will be 5%. So again, guys, 194 uh, O uh, we've seen and 206A, both we've seen both. This one is a new section. And in this section, there is a small amendment. What is the new section? That e-commerce operators need to deduct 1% of the sale of the price that they're supposed to pay to the e-commerce participant and pay to the government instead. That 1% can be increased to 5% under 206AA if they don't provide the PAN, card, PAN details. All right, all right, guys. Just putting this on the screen here, and we're doing both the amendments together. So 206AA and 194O. Let's do both of them together. Both are back to back only. Every e-commerce operator, while making payment to any e-commerce participants, shall deduct TDS at the rate of 1% of the gross amount of sales or services. Further, no tax shall be deducted at source if the amount credited or paid is like or likely to be credited or paid during the previous year. To any e-commerce participants does not exceed 5 lakh provided such e-commerce participant is an individual or HUF. So for individuals and HUFs, if the amount of gross value of sales does not increase is not more than 5 lakh. The amount that they need to pay, they, are, they need to be paid does not increase more than 5 lakh. That means if it's a small individual and a HUF, if it's a small individual, small HUF, then you don't need to deduct that 1% as well. But this is only for individuals HUF. If you're a partnership firm or a company selling on an e-commerce uh, platform, then no matter what your sales is, the e-commerce platform that is Amazon or Flipkart will deduct 1% and pay to the government. And 206AA says that this requirement of 1% will increase to 5%. Why? If you don't provide your PAN details. As these two amendments are the amendments for e-commerce, one new section and one amendment to an existing section. I hope you understood this. 194OO is for online. 
the next amendment guys is one of the most significant amendments the uh, finance act 2020 made i'm just going to put something on the screen watch this and see how life has changed in a big way in terms of tax for a lot of people all right guys this is a company and let's call it reliance industries limited and this is the shareholder but of course there is not one shareholder there are lakhs and crores of shareholders of reliance just one second so yes so reliance has like lakhs and lakhs of shareholders and you know when reliance used to you used to pay dividend or still pays dividend when they pay dividend you know for the government to ensure that lakhs and lakhs of shareholders pay tax on their dividend was getting very difficult so the government made a change in the income tax act many years ago saying that when you pay dividend reliance when reliance pays dividend in the hands of the shareholders this was exempt so that means the government doesn't want tax of course they want tax but they said that instead of chasing lakhs and lakhs of shareholders why don't i ask reliance only that while you are paying this tax with dividend to the uh, to the shareholders please pay a dividend distribution tax so the government's problem is solved they don't have to chase lakhs of shareholders and it's very easy to collect tax from one person instead of collecting it from lakhs of people but this changed guys and now they abolished dividend distribution tax they now say that everything is electronic we exactly know who is getting the dividend so we will now go back to the old days whereby reliance declares a dividend and it is taxable now in the hands of shareholder so life is simple so now when you have income from house property now you have pgvp income now you have capital gain just like that in ifos you will have dividend income i hope this is understood this dividend income is always under ifos now that you know dividend income is taxable here when the company declares and pays dividend they need to deduct tds on this payment because the government no shareholders will pay tax but they might pay tax really really late so the government says that reliance when you declare this dividend please deduct tds at the rate of 10% and when you declare distribute this dividend please deduct tds at the rate of 10% and pay it to us so now guys there is an additional condition on reliance not just to declare and distribute the dividend but also to deduct tds and pay to the government but of course if the shareholder guys if the shareholder is a small shareholder like an individual and he is not getting dividend of more than 5000 so unke liye bola hai unke liye tds mat deduct karna so if it's a small shareholder like an individual who is not getting more than 5000 rupees of dividend don't deduct it for him for the others deduct it flat rate of 10% now same way guys we will discuss two amendments together same way this is section 194 by the way 194 puts an onus on the companies that when you are declaring dividend deduct tds and pay to the government at the rate of 10% exception individuals earning very low dividend that is 5000 rupees up to 5000 rupees same way guys i these shareholders now make them unit holders that means they are not shareholders they are unit holders because they are not buying shares they are buying units of mutual fund they don't know how to invest in shares or they don't want to take the risk of investing in shares themselves so they buy units of a mutual fund and you know guys mutual fund there are many kinds of mutual funds one is income based mutual funds one is growth mutual fund so mutual funds also mutual funds also give out dividend or they give out returns in the form of income and again when they also do that guys when they also do that they need to deduct tds at the rate of 10% so whether you are a company declaring dividend or a mutual fund declaring dividend you both need to deduct tds at the rate of 10% Let's look at this from the book. I've given you the background. Let's look at this. Let's look at the main section first, section one ninety four. TDS on dividends, very very interesting because now guys, companies ke hath se gaya and individuals ke hath mein tax hota hai dividend, but companies need to deduct TDS. The principal officer of an Indian company or a company which has made the prescribed arrangements for the declaration and payment of dividends, including dividends on preference shares. So every one guys, whether you are getting equity shares. डिविडेंड या प्रेफरेंस शेयर डिविडेंड टीडीएस कट के बाद आपको पैसा मिलेगा विद इन इंडिया शैल बिफोर मेकिंग एनी पेमेंट बाय एनी मोड इन रिस्पेक्ट ऑफ एनी डिविडेंड और बिफोर मेकिंग एनी डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन और पेमेंट टू द शेयर होल्डर हु इज अ रेसिडेंट इन इंडिया ऑफ एनी डिविडेंड डिडक्ट फ्रॉम द अमाउंट ऑफ सच डिविडेंड इनकम टैक्स एट द रेट ऑफ 10% सो इफ यू आर एन इंडियन कंपनी डिक्लेअरिंग अ डिविडेंड देन यू नीड टू डिडक्ट टीडीएस एट द रेट ऑफ 10% in case of shareholders so shareholders they will tax it in their hands but you have to deduct tds at the rate of 10% however no such deduction shall be made in the case of shareholder the following conditions are met here is a small individual 
डिविडेंड इज पेड एनी मोर अदर दैन कैश ऑफकोर्स डिविडेंड इज ऑलवेज पेड थ्रू अदर मोड स्काइज बैंक में डायरेक्टली आता है एंड द अमाउंट ऑफ सच डिविडेंड और द कैश केस में विद एग्रीगेट ऑफ द अमाउंट ऑफ सच डिविडेंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड और पेड और लाइकली टू भी डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड और पेड डॉरिंग द फाइनेंशियल ईयर बाय द कम टू द शेयर होल्डर डज नॉट एक्सीड फाइव थाउजेंड रुपीज फाइव थाउजेंड तक है तो नो प्रॉब्लम उसके ऊपर नहीं होना चाहिए सो लेट्स मैंने डिक्लेयरिंग डिविडेंड टू अ पर्सन सो एवरी अकाउंट में यूर ट्रांसफरिंग जिस सी फाइव थाउजेंड के ऊपर है तो डिडक्ट टी डी एस एंड देन पे फाइव थाउजेंड है के नीचे है फाइव थाउजेंड है और इंडिविजुअल है सामने वाला देन नो नीड डिडक्ट टी डी एस दिस इज सेक्शन वन नाइनटी फोर टी डी एस ऑन डिविडेंस बाई दे गाइज दिस सेक्शन इज ऑलवेज देयर बट इट गॉट हिडन बिकॉज ऑफ डिविडेंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन टैक्स नाउ दैट देर इज नो डिविडेंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन टैक्स नाउ दैट इट इज टैक्सीबल इन हैंड शेयर होल्डर्स द गवर्मेंट सेज वी विल नॉट वेट फॉर द शेयर होल्डर्स टू फाइल द रिटर्न एंड कलेक्ट टी Uh, then collect tax, so might as well deduct TDS when they are being paid. However, guys, the majority dividends are earned by who? The major Indian India's major shareholding. A lot of companies are held by LIC, by GIC, by other insurance business companies. So for them, for these government business companies, there is no TDS implications. So when Reliance is paying a lot of dividend, but If the person who's earning the dividend is LIC, GIC, or such other nationalized insurance companies, then there is no TDS in that case. So the smallest individuals they escape TDS, and the biggest insurance companies they escape TDS. This is just because they don't want to reduce the income or the cash flow of these companies. Same way, guys. Section one ninety four K. Very interesting. One ninety four K is the same thing, but for mutual funds. Any mutual fund. or any other specified company responsible for paying income in connection with units they don't call it dividend actually they call it income on the units but it's the same like dividend shall deduct tax at the rate of 10% rate is also the same provided the amount paid or payable to a particular person during the particular year is not is exceeding 5000 so here also the requirement is only above 5000 but here individual nahi hai so mutual funds have to only see one thing when they are making a payment is it more than 5000 deduct tds if it's less than 5000 or equal to 5000 don't deduct tds they don't have to see whether the samne wala person is an individual or not just recapping guys company paying dividend or mutual fund company paying dividend that is income please whenever you are paying a payment deduct tds at the rate of 10% and pay to the government but for companies see if the person is too small individual earning up to 5000 no tds for mutual funds anyone earning up to 5000 no tds and for companies paying to lic gic etc is an exception don't deduct tds in that case i hope this is very very clear this one summarizes two tds sections 194 and 194k how do you remember it the best mutual fund is kotak mutual fund starts with a k i hope you got both these sections right all right continuing with the concept of dividend guys continuing with the concept of dividend i just want to put some more light on dividend now that we're talking about dividend let's discuss a little bit more about dividend you already have a background and earlier dividend was exempt in our hands so again let's go back to those days good days when reliance or when any company would declare dividend and this was a shareholder and in the hands of the shareholder this income was exempt so let's say the shareholder earned 1 lakh rupees dividend this was exempt this was exempt under section 1034 but that section is now no more there so let's not focus on that section this dividend guys was exempt was exempt and as you know in case you are earning any exempt income us pe deduction to milega nahi aapko because if that income is not coming as part of your calculation or computation of income you don't get any deduction now having said that having said that so your dividend income earlier was exempt and hence you would not get any deduction so let's say i have taken a small loan i have taken a small loan and i bought shares on those shares i have earned some dividend income or i have taken a small loan and i have earned some exempt income that on that loan i pay some interest on that i will not get a deduction this used to be happening earlier but now guys this is no more and now the dividend is taxable in my hands so i am the shareholder this is my dividend income let's say this is my dividend income 1 lakh rupees let's say 2 lakh rupees now it's taxable so this is taxable so to earn any taxable income i can have expenses example if i am running this institute to teach uh, i can pay my faculties i can have uh, renting etc expenses so in any business there are expenses same way to earn dividend also can i minus some expenses they say you can minus but you can only minus interest so if you've taken some loan and with that borrowed money you bought shares and on that you are earning dividend you can minus interest but maximum interest deduction 
will be at the rate of 20%. Maximum interest deduction that can happen will be happening only at 20%. So let's see this section. There's no particular section for this, but let's see it from the book. How is it mentioned? It's mentioned under a heading called dividend income. As earlier, there was section 1034, 1035, 1150, 115R, but thankfully there are no more because now life is simple. The company declares dividend, the mutual fund declares dividend, and the shareholders, unit holders, they get the dividend and they pay the tax. So they haven't deleted. Section 115 BBDA was another section for dividend which also has been deleted. So all these sections have been deleted. So no discussion on them. I've just mentioned it so that you know they've been deleted. However, if you are earning any dividend income, right? If you are earning any dividend income, and as you know, dividend income is always under IFOS head. There is a section called section 56, subsection 2, which says that certain incomes will always be under IFOS and dividend income is always under IFOS. Now, if dividend income is always under IFOS, if dividend income is always under IFOS, to kya mujhe skik against, can I take some expenses also? So this one says that as per section 57, 57 is for deduction. 57, 56 may you earn income, income from other sources. And then if you have some related deductions, you can take deductions also. So as for section 57, if any person, you, has incurred any expense in earning the dividend or income from any mutual fund, such expenses shall not be allowed while computing income. So if you expend some money, but what have you spent on? To earn dividend, guys, what do you spend money on? To earn dividend, how can you spend money? What, what are your expenses to earn dividend? Dividend is given by the company. So how can you say there are expenses? However, any interest paid shall be allowed to be deducted maximum 20%. So any other expenses, no other expenses. So on that dividend income, let's say my dividend income is 2 lakh. Can I take telephone expenses? Can I take AC expenses saying that to earn that dividend, I spend money on the telephone or nothing doing. You will only get one expense that is interest. That too, if you are paying interest and that to maximum 20% of this income. Let's take the example. Mr. X has taken a loan of 10 lakhs, huge loan, 10 lakh rupees. On that, he's paying interest of 1 lakh rupees. This is the interest. This is his expense. Why has he taken this loan? He has invested the amount in shares and received dividend of 2 lakhs. Congratulations, you have earned dividend of 2 lakh rupees. Can I minus this interest of 1 lakh under section 57? No, you cannot. Because 1 lakh is too big an amount. The maximum you can minus is 20,000. So you can, sorry, 20%. So that is 40,000. So the maximum you can deduct is 40,000. In this case, interest allowed to be deducted shall be 40,000 and the balance 60, 1,60,000 shall be taxable. So 1,60,000 shall be taxable. So again, guys, recapping it, is dividend income taxable? Yes, it's taxable under which had always under IFOS. You tax it under 56,2. And then will I be allowed a deduction of any expense dividend kamane ke liye? What is the expense? There is no expense. Except we'll allow you interest if you paid actually for this earning this income, if you pay interest, we'll allow it with maximum 20% of that dividend income. Further, guys, not just the dividend paid by the company, the company pays interim dividend. I hope you know interim dividend is it can be paid any time on the year, throughout the year, any time when the company does well, they want to reward the shareholders, they pay interim dividend. And the company can pay a final dividend. So at the end, when they conclude their accounts, at the annual general meeting, they can declare a final dividend. But besides that, a lot of payments made by the company to the shareholders. A lot of payments made by the company to the shareholders. Like, like releasing assets. They, they gave gold coins. Or issuing debentures to already shareholders. Ko debentures de de de. So if I'm a shareholder, I have been given debentures. Basically, I'm benefiting the shareholders, but I'm not calling it dividend, guys. I'm distributing assets. I'm issuing debentures. I'm giving them some other benefit and I'm not calling it dividend, but this will be deemed dividend under a section called section 222. Section 2, subsection 22 says that these payments made will be called deemed dividend. And guys, remember deemed dividend has five sections. Sorry, clauses. Clause A is when you release assets of the company. So let's say the company, instead of declaring dividend, give everyone a gold coin. So they're saying this is not dividend. No, but this is deemed dividend under 222A. Instead of giving money, they distributed bonds or debentures. How do you remember this? B for bonds and debentures. 
B for bonds and debentures. So you're a shareholder. They didn't pay you money. They gave you debentures, and they said this is not dividend. No, this is deemed dividend. Or on the closure of the company. Closure means guys. <clears throat> closure means liquidation of the company. They declare. They give you some asset on liquidation. Liquidation is closure. Why am I saying closure? Because C is for liquidation. C is for closure. Or when they decrease. D is for decrease. When they reduce your share capital. Let's say your share was first for hundred rupees. Now they reduced it to one rupee and they paid you ninety nine. And they're saying this is not dividend. I've reduced the share capital. No, that is also dividend. Or in the extreme case, E is the extreme case. They want to give you money, but they don't want to call it dividend. So they give you a loan instead. This is only applicable to closely held companies when they give loans and advances to people who have beneficial interest. Remember. E one I'm talking about two twenty two E is when a, a closely held company gives a loan or advance to a shareholder holding ten percent or more in the company that is beneficial interest. Then in that case, this loan will be considered deemed dividend. So guys, two twenty two gives out five instances, five clauses of deemed dividend, and e all these five clauses have you proved that it's deemed dividend? Yes. Is it income? Yes. Who's in whose hands is going to be taxable? Always now in the hands of the shareholder. So whether it's dividend. Interim or final, or whether it's deemed dividend, who is going to pay tax on it? Shareholders are going to pay tax on this. I hope you understood this point on dividend income. So, guys, dividend income is completely over. On that TDS section one ninety four, that is also over. Section one ninety four K is also over. Let's go to the next one, guys. So, dividend we've done a lot of discussion, and that is over now. The next two ones are really, really simple, simple ones. So we'll do it directly from the book. Very simple ones, guys. There is a section called 194J. It's a TDS section, 194J. So when I, I'll give you an example. I'm a chartered accountant, and when my clients pay me, when my clients pay me, so let's say I bill my client one lakh rupees. When they pay me, they pay me one lakh less TDS at the rate of 10 percent. So they pay me 90,000, and 10,000 they pay to the government. This is, guys. This ten percent, ten percent of uh, TDS which they deduct is under one ninety four J. So one ninety four J is basically on a couple of services. Example, on technical services. When you provide technical services, on professional services like accounting is professional services. On directors remuneration. So if directors. as directors get paid when they come for sitting fees when they come for the board of directors meeting they get paid and also when you are paying for royalty so example when you've taken some technology when you borrowed some technology you pay royalty against it so in all four payments are you going to make the payment yes they're going to make the payment but when they make the payment they will deduct 10% under 194j how do you remember it j is for jealous and guys professionals these are all professionals directors professionals technical people they're all jealous of each other all the jealous that's the reality no no that's not but i'm just giving you a shortcut to remember the section section 194j so tds has to be deducted and it has to be deducted at the rate of 10% so when a technical guy is getting paid or when a ca is getting paid or when a director is getting paid or you're paying royalty so whenever you're making these payments you need to deduct tds at the rate of 10% but now guys slight change here for technical services only out of this bracket of four services only one service that is technical services now on them the tds rate has been reduced from 10% to a very very small percentage of 2% so not on professional fees not on director remuneration not on royalty only and only on technical service this has been reduced to 2% only that's a very small change here in section 194j so in case they ask in the exam 194j question Payment TDS has to be deducted at the rate of two percent only. Next one, guys. Tax audit mention. In a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, they would say that individuals and HUFs who are not subject to tax audit. This section does not apply to individuals or HUFs who are not subject to tax audit. That means they mention they are talking about really small individuals. Example, let's say, guys, tomorrow you become a doctor. but you've just become a doctor should you don't get too many patients and your income is not too much and if your income is not too much that means it does not cross 50 lakhs you don't have to get yourself audited under income tax act so then in that case they would mention that the some provisions would not apply to you and when they would mention it they would say it would not apply to people who are not subject to tax audit 
But now, guys, tax audit has two different limits. We just seen one crore also. It could be five crore also. So hence, instead of saying that it does not apl apply to tax audit limits, now the mentioning, the way of mentioning has changed. Now, wherever they have to mention, whichever sections they have to mention, tax audit, they don't say tax audit. They say one crore or fifty lakhs. Fifty lakhs for professionals and one crore for businessmen. Let's read it. Earlier, in some of the sections, it was mentioned that in case of individuals and HUFs. If audit was required in the earlier year, tax was to be deducted. So they would not mention the turnover. They would mention if they were auditable or not. But now, instead of that, the turnover is mentioned like one crore or fifty lakhs in case of profession. In case of business, one crore. Example. Let's say there is a section called one ninety four I or one ninety four I A, and they say that this section does not apply. Uh, a TDS is not to be deducted in case you are making payments to an individual or an HUF who are not subject to tax tax audit in the previous year. But now instead of saying this, it will be the same thing. But they will say this section is not applicable to individuals and HUFs who have not crossed the turnover of one crore or fifty lakh in the last year. So just the way of talking about it has changed because now, guys, for audit there are different limits. So instead of those limits. Uh, sorry instead of the mention they talk about the limits 1 crore and 50 lakh respectively i hope this is clear guys two more two more down we're very close to a few more and then we'll be done we we'll let, let's move on to the next one all right let's go to the next one guys the next one uh, let's take this one um okay so surcharge as we're talking about surcharge and as you know that surcharge is applicable on higher income people so if you earn a big income then surcharge is applicable So let's talk about this one surcharge applicability on dividend income. Earlier surcharge was applicable maximum fifteen percent on short term one 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 a and long term one one two a, but now dividend income has also been included and surcharge applicable shall be maximum fifteen percent. What is this? I'll give you through an example. But first, let's see the rates, guys. If I earn more than fifty lakhs, if I earn more than fifty lakhs, then the surcharge is ten percent. Double that. If I earn more than one crore. So from fifty lakhs to one crore, I will pay a surcharge. Surcharge is a tax on tax. So whatever my tax is on that, I'll pay ten percent more. That is a surcharge at the rate of ten percent. More than one crore, if I earn, then I would pay a surcharge of fifteen percent. Double that. More than two crore, if I earn, I will pay a surcharge of twenty-five percent. And guys, a little more than double that. If I earn more than five crore rupees, guys, how many people in India earn more than five crore? Very few. They will have to pay a surcharge of thirty-seven percent. So coming back, guys, surcharge is not paid by no, most people because in India we are a developing country. We are almost uh, a poor country getting into developing country. Uh, it's a very, very, very difficult for people to earn so much money. So, but if people are earning more, the government wants to tax them by adding a sur certain surcharge, which is a tax on tax. So this ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty-five percent, and thirty-seven percent is not on your income; it's on the tax that you pay. So if your total income, that means after deductions, everything, after setting off of losses, everything, if your total income is more than fifty lakh and up to one crore, you pay a surcharge of ten percent. If it's more than one crore, up to two crore, fifteen percent. From two crore to five crore, twenty-five percent, and more than five crore. So the biggest industrialist of the country, the biggest CEO of the CEO of the country, pay a surcharge of thirty-seven percent, which is too much. So let's take an example. If my total income, guys, is one point two crores, then will I pay tax? Of course, I will pay tax. Will I pay surcharge? Yes, I will pay surcharge at the rate of at the rate of fifteen percent of my tax. I will add fifteen percent. But but if my normal income, PGBP income, guys, is one point two crores. But let's say I have other incomes also. Let's take PGBP income or to be. Uh, let's take another number. Let's say two point two crores. And I have other income also. Let's say short term capital gain under section one 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 a, and long term capital gain under section one one two a. What are these? These are those gains that you make on EUU equity shares. Units of a mutual fund and units of a equity oriented fund. Anyways, so these are basically those gains you made on which you paid securities transaction tax. Guys, remember, 
you've already paid a small tax called securities transaction tax to the government already and that income this income guys is 60 lakhs so how much surcharge would you pay 2.2 crores plus 60 lakhs is 2.8 crores so basically you are lying here so will you pay surcharge of 25% no you will now split it up on this 2.2 crores you will pay a surcharge of 25% why because that's more than 2 crores and on this 60 lakh how much surcharge will you pay only 10% so basically you will not pay this additional surcharge of 25% and 37% on two incomes short term capital gain and long term capital gain let's change, change the numbers guys let's say this is 5.2 crores you had a lot of income or from your business 5.2 crores and let's say this is 1.2 crores then how will you look at 5.2 crores so you will on that 5.2 crores because more than 5 crores you will pay surcharge at the rate of 37% and on that 1.2 crores how much will you pay as you will split it up 1.2 crores means 15% what about its 2.2 crores even then guys it's 15% so that means the maximum surcharge you pay on 111a and 112a kind of capital gain is maximum 15% same way guys they added it they added to the party they said besides these two even if you earn dividend income even if you this year earn dividend income then even on dividend income can you have surcharge of course you can have you'll have 10% surcharge you'll have 15% surcharge but you can never have 25% and 37% surcharge on dividend income that's what they are trying to say a very very simple line that the same surcharge applicability that is maximum 15% will now be applicable even on dividend income so if you earn a lot of dividend income you might have to pay surcharge but don't worry not the 25% and not the 37% surcharge not that on dividend income as well quickly let's go to the other deductions guys this is a deductions from gti so what is gti first you have all your heads of income you add up all the heads of income so the five heads of income you add it up you will get a number on that number guys if there is any clubbing that means your wife your children uh, some other assets ka income you need to add so you will add that and from that if you want to set off any current year losses or let's say last year's losses which you were carrying forward you will minus you will minus that and then whatever is there is called gti that is gross total income from gross total income you minus deductions under chapter 6a and we are talking about those deductions from gti what has changed very few things have changed and guys very interestingly very interestingly these are covid these are somewhere somewhere related to covid as well first up atg you get a 100% deduction if you donate to pm cares fund pm cares fund was basically to targeting covid that time they had made a pm cares fund so if you do, donate to that you get a 100% deduction under atg that is one under atgga under atgga or basically you know in you know uh, giving money to research organizations research institutions there you can donate in cash but the cash limit was earlier 10000 now it has been reduced to 2000 because guys the government's agenda is they want to reduce cash transaction so from 10000 they reduce that to 2000 gg is not a very common thing g is very common and if they want to ask g they can ask pm cash fund because that is now 100% reduction earlier this fund was not there it was created for a specific purpose and for this purpose if you donate now it's 100% deduction and guys there's a very small change in the section called section 80 eea first what is 80 eea there was section called 80 eea which is easy emi again it's a shortcut to remember the section easy emi again what does this mean this means that buy a house buy a house which is less than or equal to 45 lakhs that means a small house i'm currently in bombay and in bombay in 45 lakhs you don't get a very big house even in bangalore you don't get a huge house but if you buy a house which is affordable that is up to 45 lakh rupees and it is small so they've given you two limits in one metro cities and non metro cities they've given you limits that means you're not buying a very big house if you buy this house and if you take a loan but this loan has to be from either a financial institution a bank or an nbfc i hope you understand what this is financial institution is something like hdfc bank is something like hdfc bank nbfc is something like india bulls housing finance so if you take money from a financial institution including a 
banking non banking finance company nbfc and you pay interest so let's say i have taken a house which is up to for 45 lakhs i have taken that on loan and the interest that i am paying on this house is guys 2 lakh 35000 this year but guys remember ifhp in income from house property your gav this is a self occupied property by its condition is you should be occupying it you should be occupying it and you should not have any other house so your gav will be nil your municipal taxes you don't deduct nil this is self occupied ke liye i'm talking about your nav will be nil your deductions in the 24a the 30% will be nil but your interest deduction you will get up to 2 lakh so ifhp in case of self occupied gives you a deduction up to 2 lakh maximum deduction up to 2 lakh but my interest payment this year is 2 lakh 35000 so up to 2 lakh i can take under ifhp and the excess amount i can take under this section because this section says that first calculate a gti from that i will give you an additional de de deduction up to 1 and a half lakh rupees under ateea so ateea talks about another deduction so guys you get two interest benefits but not the same one so if you take 2 lakh here you cannot again take this on the same interest payment here as well so if you've taken 2 lakh interest deduction in ifhp then and your interest deduction was anyways 2 lakh your interest payment was anyways 2 lakh then nothing under this section but let's say your interest payment was more than 2 lakhs and ifhp could not suffice it then you would rather take the excess deduction under ateea eea is easy emi again because this section was there earlier now it got introduced earlier it was called ateee now it's called ateea easy emi again that's a shortcut to remember this i'll tell you the conditions the house should be small it should be about 45 lakhs you should not own any other house when you're buying this house and guys it can be self occupied or let out no problem if you interest you're paying you will get another additional deduction of 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees in this provided ifhp deduction is not appropriate for you if it's not enough for you then you can take ateea what is the change here guys the change here is only one small thing that earlier the loan had to be sanctioned between to 1st april 2019 to 31st march 2020 but you know what has happened in the last year and hence they've extended it that you can buy this loan and for this loan you can take for this house you can take a loan up to 31st march 21 so even today you can take this loan and you can get eligible for atea i hope this is clear guys this gti deduction is done gti deduction is done let's move ahead now Guys, next deduction is let's take a very simple one. Guys, let's take a really simple one. Is on capital gain. In capital gain, we do indexation. That means if I bought an asset like seven years back and I'm selling it today, sale consideration is whatever I got get today. But the cost will not be the original cost. I can take the index cost of acquisition. Same thing for cost of improvement. Index cost of improvement. It basically links your cost to the inflation and it increases your cost. It's a benefit. And for that. for the financial year 2021 the capital gain indexation is 301 that's just a clarification thing here so so that you know in case the exam does not give it then it's 301 mostly the exam gives this number already next let's talk about residential status and guys this amendment is really really cool this amendment is really really nice guys remember for residential status of individuals guys think about residential status of individuals there are two basic conditions for you to be a resident for you to be a resident in india you can either be a resident or you can be a non resident of course in resident also you can be a ror or rnor i let me put the diagram here guys you are either a non resident or you are a resident in a resident you can be a resident but not ordinary resident or you can be a ror that is resident and ordinary resident in terms of taxability this guy is taxed the most he's sad because he's taxed the most on his global income he's taxed whereas this guy here and this guy here are not taxed so much they're not taxed so much now that we we of course know this bifurcation there's no amendment around this bifurcation let's talk about what has happened and how do we figure that someone is a non resident or someone is a resident it actually depends upon number of days and section 61 says there are two basic conditions one is it in 
in the year in the previous year so financial year 2021 in this year if you spent 182 days or more if you spend 182 days or more during the year in the country then you are a resident ask yourself guys during covid where were you you were in india only so you are a resident and the second condition if this is not met then you go to the second condition that this year your stay in india was 60 days or more plus in the last 4 years that means not this year but last year and 3 more years that is last 4 years your stay in india has been 365 days or more so the second condition as the name goes second has two things one is in this year 60 days or more but in the last 4 years if your stay has been 365 days or more that means have you been habitually in india yeah 182 days or more is habitual in india but if not that the second condition again test you that maybe this year you've been in india only for 60 days or more but let's say in the last 4 years have you been in india for 365 days or more then you're a resident so either through this if you answer yes you're a resident either through this if you answer yes you're a non you're a resident so each of these basic conditions will push you and make you become a resident but what if guys I have stayed okay. So these two conditions you're okay with, but these two conditions don't apply to some people. Who are these people? Indian citizens or persons of Indian origin. Guys, Indian citizens or persons of Indian origin who are visiting India. So Vijay Malia's son Siddharth Malia, who is abroad, and he comes to India and he stays in India for one fifty days. Let's see whether we make him a resident or not. Again, I repeat, guys. these two basic conditions are for residential status but the second condition this one does not apply does not apply to in indian citizens or persons of indian origin visiting india so let's take an example of vijay malia son siddharth malia who is visiting india in the year for 150 days he is in india let's ask him the first condition have your stay in india been 182 days or more he says no it's not 182 days or more it's only 150 days the second condition would not apply only to him so then what would happen guys he will be considered as a non resident he would be considered as a non resident so he spent 150 days in india from india he was controlling his business in london but still he is considered a non resident and india does not get to tax that income which he was controlling from india i'll repeat vijay malia's son was in india for 150 days and while he was in india he was controlling a lot of businesses outside india but that unfortunately could not be taxed here that unfortunately could not be taxed in india because he was a non resident so they said they said they made an amendment they made an amendment that in such cases if an indian citizen or a person of indian origin in such cases where you have indian income of more than 15 lakhs not to everyone not to everyone only if an indian citizen or person of indian origin having income of more than 15 lakhs then the second condition will apply to you wow but instead of 60 days we will change it to 120 days so ask yourself vijay malia san siddharth malia that 120 days or more have you stayed in india yes 150 days and four years in the last four years more than 65 yes so now you have caught now you are in the resident category but don't worry we'll always keep you in the resident and not an rnor category don't worry we'll not put you in ror category we'll put you in rnor category that means what that means what we don't want to tax your global income so we'll not put you in this category but you have a lot of indian income you have indian income of more than 15 lakh rupees so that of course we will tax and all those income which you control from india you had business in london which you controlling from india that we will tax in india because we want to now designate you as a resident and not ordinary resident let's repeat this one last time so for him for a indian citizen or a person of indian origin guys does a second option up, uh, apply no it doesn't apply even till today but if you are an indian citizen person of indian origin earning more than 15 lakh of indian income then the second provision applies second condition applies to you but instead of 60 days it is 120 days and if it applies you are a resident if you say yes to that you are a resident but always r n o r all right if you understood this you've understood the case of siddharth malia vijay malia's son who was staying in india for 150 days 
now he is under tax and now he is under rnor similarly guys nirav modi have you heard of nirav modi of course who hasn't everyone in india heard of nirav modi and he also left india his son also comes to india he spends 150 days in india he spends 100 days in london he spends another 100 days in new york and the balance days in mauritius so he is basically spending different different days in different different country and by the way guys he is not a resident of any country how let's check in india 182 days or more no 150 days second condition does not apply to him because he is a indian citizen person of indian origin visiting india so if if these conditions don't apply to him and unfortunately he is not a resident of any country that means his income is not being taxed anywhere very smart but he let's say he has he has indian income of 15 lakhs of more sorry he has indian income of more than 15 lakhs then because you are nowhere you are not considered a resident anywhere in the world we will consider you our own so we will consider you as a resident but always a resident and not ordinary resident So guys, there are very smart people who try and avoid residency in any part of the world. How do they avoid it? They first spend different different days in other countries so that none of the countries can call him a resident, so that his income is not taxed anywhere. So very smartly did it. India Indian income tax got got smarter and they introduced a new section called Section sixty nine one a. This section says that if you are an individual and an Indian citizen, not applies to doesn't apply to PIO guys. The first one, this amendment applied to PIOs. This one is only for Indian citizen. If you are an individual who is an Indian citizen, and if you have Indian income of more than fifteen lakhs, let's take the example again. Same example, Nirav Modi son. Like say thirty five days in India, thirty five days in London, thirty five days in New York, thirty five days in Australia, thirty five days in Singapore. He stays in thirty five days and leaves that country. So he is not a resident in any country, but he has Indian income of more than fifteen lakh. So, if you are an individual Indian citizen having income of Indian income of more than fifteen lakh, and you are not taxed anywhere because you are not a resident anywhere, then we will want to tax you as an R N O R. R N O R means all his Indian incomes will be taxed plus incomes that he is controlling from India, or income maybe abroad but controlled from India that also will be taxed now under six one A. So, guys, let's look at quick revision of the amendments right now. Let's do a quick revision of the amendments. Guys, income from salary. If your employer is contributing to PF, to uh, NPS, and to superannuation fund more than seven and a half lakhs, then the excess amount will be taxable in your hands under section seventeen to seven and seven A. If you are in business and profession, congratulations! Now your auditable limit is increased from one crore to five crores. But condition is that the payments and the receipts should be in cash, a maximum up to five percent individually. If you are getting a gift and that's an immovable property, and the benefit that you get is more than five percent, don't worry because that five percent is now changed to ten percent. And guys, your cost of acquisition, if your asset is very old, that is before one four two thousand one, you can take the fair market value, but that should not be more than the stamp duty value. Return of income you need to file. Not if your if my partnership firm is auditable, not just working partner, every partner gets an extended due date. And now, guys, you need to file your return and your audit report. But what comes first? Audit report first, and then the return. So, return by thirty first October. Audit report by one month before. So, A comes before R. One ninety four A, one ninety four O. Sorry. If you are into e commerce and if you are paying money to people like Amazon is paying to its sellers on Amazon seller, uh, then they need to deduct TDS at the rate of one percent, but not to individual HOF who don't have to be paid more than five lakh in a year. Also, this one percent. Can be exceeded to five percent in case you don't give a pen. One ninety four O done. One ninety four K and one ninety four is when companies and mutual funds pay dividend. They will deduct TDS at the rate of ten percent unless your dividend income is less than five thousand or up to five thousand. Guys, one ninety four J for professionals. Guys, they have reduced the rate only for technical services for two percent. Income from G G T I. Uh, we've seen residential status. We've seen A T M bonds. Capital gains. We've seen. and that guys brings us to the end of this dividend of this amendment lecture just one second stopping the share talking to you guys so how do you tackle this amendment lecture best keep the sheet in front of you while you keep the sheet in front of you listen to this video lecture 
and then revise all the amendments at one go don't worry even if you miss out an amendment while you're studying from the book so in the book if you've got an updated book and you're studying from an updated book great but if let's say your book is old let's say you missed an attempt let's say you've taken an additional attempt and your book is slightly old don't worry study from there and then at one go study all the amendments that it goes much faster i hope you've understood this really well reach out to us in case you have any doubts and i think this more or less should cover all your amendments at one place so all the best guys do really really well i'm keeping all my fingers crossed for you guys all the best and good luck thank you